I'm going to Texas for three speaking engagements coming up March 22nd, 23rd, 24th. And I would love a chance to see you there. Dallas, the 22nd, Austin, Saturday, the 23rd. And then Sunday morning, I'll be in Houston at Houston Oasis. Dallas is a ticketed event. The others are totally free. And all the details on everything are at my personal website. You can log on to sethandrews.net slash events. Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. Never stop learning. Really. I mean, never stop discovering new things and enhancing your knowledge base. That's why I love The Great Courses Plus, and I'm so glad they're a sponsor of this broadcast, because they have thousands of lectures on a huge variety of topics that just stream right to me, right into my life, whether I'm watching videos on my computer or listening to the podcast version in my car. So many subjects, so many categories, everything from brain science to emergency medicine to learning how to speak Spanish to how to cook or different cooking dishes, playing the piano. Lately, I've been enjoying The Skeptic's Guide to Health, Medicine, and the Media. It's a lecture series by Dr. Roy Benarok, and he's talking about the media and its responsibility when it comes to public health. And of course, this is hugely relevant with the big measles outbreaks that have been happening. And that's just one of thousands of options at The Great Courses Plus. And to help get your journey of discovery started, they're offering my listeners a free trial of unlimited access to the entire library. Start your free trial right now and show your support of this broadcast. Sign up using my special URL. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Seth. What you're going to hear today is a candid and sometimes very frank conversation between me and a local pastor. His name is Caleb Moore. He was introduced to me and expressed interest in having a conversation either on my show or on his podcast, and he has a show of his own, to talk about Christianity, about God, about atheism, and whatever else came up. And as I'm all about dialogue and conversations, I said, absolutely. So we came to my house just a few days ago. We both sat down in front of microphones and we spoke for almost two hours. And we made a guarantee to each other at the front end. And I'll make this guarantee to you as well. What you're going to hear has not been edited. And to my knowledge, Pastor Moore isn't going to do any of that either. I mean, I don't know if he's going to do commentary on his own show or what. I'm not. I'm just going to play you the interview. I think the conversation stands on its own. Okay, that's what you're going to hear today. He spends the first, I think, 10, 15 minutes kind of telling his story, and then he and I really get a chance to engage each other. And I hope you enjoy this exchange of ideas between myself and Pastor Caleb Moore. It's interesting, you know, I'm all about conversations. I'm always talking about having conversations and how people who have a disagreement about something that's really even important to them, they should be able to sit in a room and not just hang out, but perhaps even be friendly, be friends. I hope that's what today is. I've got Caleb Moore in studio. Hey, Caleb. Hey, we can high five afterwards. Do I call you Pastor Caleb? No, please. Brother Caleb. Uh, Honorable Reverend uh, (laughs) is my preferred title. You're a local pastor, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. You are. What kind of church is it? It's a Reformed Southern Baptist church. Which, right. For those yeah. who are thinking, what's a Reformed Southern Baptist church? So we kind of took the things we liked about Southern Baptist, but trimmed the fat. So we don't have a lot of the traditions that maybe people who grew up Southern Baptist might have. So we don't think dancing is of the devil. You can play cards, right? Things like that, that maybe I was brought up to. So we're, we're always trying to get back to what scripture actually says and forget about some of these man-made traditions that we might have invented. So you've got some like 
alcohol in the communion glasses? That kind uh, of? Maybe in the cabinets at home. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. The, the main reason is because we have a lot of recovering addicts that come, so right. not that we're opposed to. I was making a joke, wine, right? Because yeah, no, I was raised in yeah. kind of a Puritan family where yeah. a beer in the fridge, they'd have an intervention scheduled. You know, tonight. Oh yes, right? yeah. uh, it's one of the great many vices that we were warned against. It's a, a gateway to greater sins and disobedience in the eyes of man and God. Right. One of uh, the great jokes in Baptist circles is if you take a Baptist fishing, only, only take, uh, never take one, because if you take one, he'll drink all your beer. You need the second one to guilt him into not drinking. So the one I heard was if uh, let's see the. Reformed Baptists don't recognize the Southern Baptists in church, and the Southern Baptists don't recognize each other at a bar. Yes, and I always yes. thought that was interesting. Yeah. So. You, you can tell those who grew up in the Southern Baptist when you're at the grocery store and they try to hide what's in their cart. So they just kind of hide it behind their back. Oh, hey, preacher. And, I'm yeah. interested in, in you know how the Baptist church has evolved. It's going through its own problems right now with the expose of sexual abuse within the church, which is... Something in the Catholic Church has been going on, has had going on for a long, long time, and and um, but as far as culturally, you know, the frozen chosen model is sort of given way to this. I don't know. It's it's not necessarily a life church model, but you know what I mean. It's contemporary. Yeah. The pastors have tattoos, right? Yes. As you do, yeah, yeah. right? Correct. I mean, you've seen. Is this uh, an appeal to younger people? What do you think explains that? There's a, a lot of it. I see the message uh, watered down, basically, because people aren't just ignorant about scripture. Uh, people are just ignorant in general. So the church has reflected that we're too afraid to. You know, we almost protect them from their Bible a little bit. So everything is going to be, hey, here's just basic kindergarten level stuff. And we're going to rehash that to you, but we'll make it more exciting this way. So laser lights, rock band. So we're going to rehash it to where it's more exciting, but it's just the same thing you learned in kindergarten because we don't think you can handle the depth. And I think postmodernism plays a little bit of a role into that where we've elevated emotions extremely high and that's infiltrated evangelism. We talking about... The motivational speaker kind of evangelism. Yeah. You are yeah. somebody, yeah. you know, happy, clappy, go be a success today. Joel Osteen type stuff, if I may. That, yeah. And the interesting thing of, of where we're from in Tulsa is like the prosperity gospel came from here, right? You know, it gets its origination very much from Oral Roberts and Rama. And so a lot of that has that same influence of God wants to make you happy. He's going to make you rich. He's going to give you the nice car. Don't you worry. You know, he's on your team. So he's going to give you all the stuff that your earthly heart desires. And, and he's it, going to start with me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it does. It works its way up, doesn't it? It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Those pyramid schemes, how the top guys, it works. So you're cynical about, not say cynical, skeptical no. about yeah. The name it and claim it kind of prosperity teachings. I think that's what we would have in common is I feel like I'm a skeptic when I uh, my main I, I used to kind of swim in these Christian atheist circles a lot. But, I'm you know, it's good to be here because it kind of reignites my brain in that way. But my arena for the last probably eight years has been Mormonism, where I go to Salt Lake and I train churches to engage them. And a question I just asked to LDS, uh, which they like to be called Latter-day Saints, yeah, yeah. at uh, the mall the other day, the first thing I asked, I said, hey, were you brought up Mormon? And they said, yeah. I said, don't you think it's a coincidence that the faith you believe to be true is the one you were brought up in? And I think every Christian should ask himself that same question. Like, of course you believe it's true. It's what you were brought up to believe. How convenient, right? And if they've never had that introspection, that self-reflection, I think they've done themselves a disservice because I was like, how are you going to evangelize me and tell me what I believe is incorrect if you haven't analyzed to say, well, is even what I believe correct? It's like, you're just kind of maybe living off of the scraps of your parents' faith and they told you and you trust your parents and they're nice people. So you just go, okay. Well, let's unpack that here in just a second. Mm -hmm. But tell me about what you came out of. Were your parents religious? Yes, uh, very much so. And we probably had somewhat of a similar upbringing. Um, my what dad, flavor of religion, if I may? Uh, it was Southern Baptist. So my dad was a youth pastor and associate pastor at the largest church in Tulsa at the time. He was there on staff for 15 years. And can I just kind of tell my little story Absolutely. here? Absolutely, go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in that environment. And what I saw... I liked it. My friends were there, but I, I never really cared much for 
the lessons. I, I was like, okay, I know David and Goliath, but I didn't know the Bible. And I didn't really feel like people were actually trying to teach me the Bible. It was just, here's a story, here's a story, here's a story. But what I would see at home was, was my family interacting with all the difficult people that were on staff. Oh, so-and-so said did this. So-and-so is having an affair. This is happening. This is happening. I was like, well, these sound like awful people. I'm like, so I don't know why you're invested in this. They don't seem to be decent human beings. My senior year, my parents gave me the option. Like they always wanted me to go to what we call quote unquote big church, right? Which is the Sunday morning, 1030. But Sunday school was an option. I was old enough to drive. So I would drive myself to Sunday school and I had lots of questions. How do I know this is true? How do I know God's even real? Can I believe any of this? I mean, you're telling me a teenage girl got pregnant by a ghost and gave birth to God, right? And I'm skeptical of that. Every conversation with my brother who prepared me was a debate. I was like, I like this movie. He says, you need to give me five reasons why it's a good movie. And if I couldn't do it, he says, well, it's not really a good movie. <laughs> so so I, I began to look at religion that way. And I noticed when I would raise my hand and I would say, how do you know God is real? The de facto answer was have faith. You just need to have faith. And to give them credit, they thought that was a good answer. Like it was from the heart and they really meant it. They had faith, but I didn't have it. So I didn't know what they meant by that. And it felt like a cop-out answer to me. So one Sunday morning as I'm sitting there and I'm listening, the way it was structured is we would sit in a big group all in a circle and then we would break out into these smaller groups. Well, the big group was supposed to be the main teaching in the small group. We were supposed to discuss it. But uh, the Sunday school teacher was a lawyer and he loved NASCAR. So for the first 30, 40 minutes, he would discuss NASCAR, talk to the other people. Oh, I went to this race and we saw this and there was a wreck. And one day I just raised my hand and I says, um, I don't think God gives a rip about your stupid NASCAR. And he says, I think you need to come sit by me. I says, no, I'm out. I'm done. And so I left church. And my, to my dad's credit, he's like, yeah, I would have left too. It's, it's totally okay that you left. That's not what they're supposed to be doing. Here's a youth pastor I want you to go meet. This guy, he's, he's smart. He's intelligent. I think he can answer your questions. And he began to kind of attempt to answer some of my questions, but it really took me under his wing and help me mature and grow. He encouraged me to go on this mission trip. And I'm in Grindelwald, Switzerland, at the bottom of the Eiger Mountain. You're old enough to remember maybe the Eiger Sanction, which is a Clint Eastwood yeah. movie, right? I'm right there. It's beautiful. It's easy to believe in God when you're staring at those mountains. And I felt like I was really growing. And I got a phone call that he had gone to his garage. He had a Bible in one hand and a gun in the other. And he didn't use the Bible. He put the gun to his head and he killed himself. And he did that because he had impregnated one of his students. He also had a newborn at home and two other kids. And at that moment, taking the whole history of everything I had experienced in the church and religion, I go, yep, it's not real. It's, it's, I'm done. So on the, <laughs> the ride home at the airport, I meet a nun She's in full nun gown, right? And I walk up to her and I just start preaching atheism. I said, you know, there is no God. Let me tell you how I can prove there is no God. These people who proclaim to be loving and kind and gracious are impregnating students that they're entrusted to look after. So um, it was a pretty impactful moment in my life. And, I mean, I can go into how I came out of that or is no, there hang anything? On. Yeah. Hold on just a sec. I mean, this sounds a little bit like a, a, a movie. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. um, you, because something had happened that had sort of rocked the foundation where you were. Yeah. You had come to a point of disbelief in all of the tenets of Christianity. You just threw it all out. Yeah, yeah, I was gone. This guy killed mm -hmm. himself in his garage. Mm -hmm. I looked up to him. He was my mentor. Right. My world is shattered. My illusions have been shattered. Mm -hmm. Screw this. And I'm an atheist. And immediately yeah. you start accosting people and telling them that there is no God. Yeah, there was a lady there. And I was like, I can't believe she's dedicating her whole life. And she's going to forgo ever finding a husband or anything like that. Yeah. So I was telling her my story. I was like, hey. I've been questioning this. Have you ever questioned it? Um, I've always been pretty comfortable with, I don't want to call it confrontation, but I'm like. I get it. I, You're not yeah, shy. Like, yeah, you can go not, through and I'm have the discussions. Sure. not a bashful person. Well, if um, you were to, and we can talk about how you mm -hmm. found God or how you rediscovered right. your faith or however when you frame, I'll let you frame it any way right, you right. want. Yeah, for sure. But um, 
do you consider yourself a person of faith? Are you, do you embrace faith? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I don't think, uh, I don't put faith, uh, of course it can be a negative, but I don't think it's always a negative. Define it. I mean, yeah. how do you define faith in your heart? Um, faith for me would be something taking, um, a belief in the future based upon what God has done in the past. So, um, I always compare it to my relationship with my wife. That is the most loving relationship that I know outside of God. And much of that relationship is based on a faith, you know, because I am I stood there about 10 years ago and I proclaimed that I'm going to love her forever. I'd only known her for less than a year. I, I proposed after six months. And it begins with an initial emotion. Like I have this overwhelming feeling of love and, uh, but I had had that before, right? I'd been in other relationships. I've been in love before, but I was making this decision that I didn't have concrete evidence was going to work out, but based upon what I had seen in the past, I believed it would. Would you consider that more of a, a trust exercise based on history? I mean, your expectation was informed by the fact that you had been close, that you had fallen in love. Yeah. That you had seen her act and react. You had already known each other in a lot of ways. Granted, you don't really know somebody till you know them. Right, right. right? Until you get married yeah. and you share that space, you do all that stuff. But, I mean, it isn't blind faith that you had. You're not mm-hmm. like, well, it's all just going to work out because I believe it will. You had real knowledge about who she was, how she acted, mm-hmm. what her character was like. Does she tell the truth? Is she trustworthy? Mm-hmm. Does she genuinely love me through thick and thin? Those things were realities in your life that informed mm-hmm. Your expectation for the future, I wouldn't call that faith. I think it's more of sort of an informed trust. Would that be fair? Which I think is what, I don't consider faith blind. And I know that gets thrown out at believers. Oh, you just have Well, the problem is, though, faith. I mean, you're talking about scriptures that say it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence mm-hmm. of things not seen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about the substance of something which we hope yeah. will happen but hasn't, which to me makes no sense. And then you have the evidence for something that we don't have evidence for. Faith becomes problematic in that way, does it not? But it's substantiated on the revelation of what God has given. So in Scripture, since we're, we're going to refer to that, um, and I like to say you brought up the yeah, Bible. Absolutely. Me, but yeah, Go ahead. So, yeah, so sure. it's a fair question. Um, we see Abraham considered the father of faith. And I don't think Abraham's faith was a blind faith. He moved in progression as to what he had at first experienced. Uh, and I think there's uh, one of my favorite extrapolations of that is the story of him being willing to sacrifice his son. You're killing me. Which I know is Caleb, one of your favorite Caleb, things to ask. you're killing me. So, so <laughs> what, I, go, what sorry, I know, so I, I know this is one of your favorite things that I'm always frustrated. Because I'd, I'd actually heard about you before I um, oh God. knew our connection. Okay. Because I've always tried to listen to the other side as much as possible. Well, what is it about my approach to the Abraham Isaac story yeah. that frustrates mm-hmm. you? Well, for me, it's just the, the, the framing of a question is always um, part of the battle, right? And so for me, it's always like, why did God ask him to do that? And if he asked you to do it, would you? And of course, if I heard a voice in, in my head that Saying, told me to kill my child. Kill your child. Yeah, absolutely would not. You so would not. Because, what, yeah. because why? Well, I think I would be put in a mental institution. So if I could, let me unpack this for you a little bit. So I like to ask the question, well, then why did Abraham do it? Why why was Abraham willing? Is there anything culturally that we know about what's going on that to him, that seemed like almost a normal thing to do? And culturally, historically speaking, that was what God's asked people to do a lot of times. So when he hears something, there is a cultural, almost consensus that this happens regularly. So his idea and understanding of God is, well, eventually this is what God's asked you to do. He comes from an area where people were sacrificing kids to the God Molech, right? So when God asks him to do that, and this is one of the first times that God introduces himself. It's his introductory statement, like, I want to show you what kind of God I am. So he starts by speaking a language that Abraham already knew. This is the gods of the culture, and he begins by associating with that. So he's like, I'm going to speak your language, and then he does something that the other gods don't do. It would be like if I adopted a a kid who had been abused and beaten by um, 
a dad his whole life. And every day the dad would come home and say, go outside and cut off a branch and I'm going to whip you with it as hard as I possibly can. And every day the boy would go out there and he would cut off the branch and he would just get beaten. And then I adopted him. And the very first time he gets in trouble, I say, go out there and get a branch. Because of that was the environment that he had always known, he goes and does it. And then when he comes inside, instead of beating him, I say, let me take that from you and let me show you what love is. I'm different than what you've always known. Okay. Well, I'm in a weird position as host because uh, we're, we're sort of splitting this yeah, broadcast, we're kind of right? Yeah, co-hosting. So, so yeah. I, I, I don't want to dominate, but at the same time, right. I want to make sure that, that you don't ever feel like I'm interrupting right. too much. No. But I hear specific things that I'm like, hang on just a second. I want to unpack that and this right. and that yeah, and this. Yeah. All right. So... You sound like an apologist, which makes sense because you have done a lot of apologetics. Right. When you say that a moral deity, and we're already presupposing that Abraham's a real guy, and I'm not right. even prepared to go yeah. there. Yeah, right? okay. Who wrote the books of the Bible that talk about Abraham. We haven't even gotten into all of that. Of course. But let's, for the sake of this discussion, presuppose that, okay, it happened and he was a real dude. Right. God says, as a faith exercise— Mm-hmm. You need to sacrifice your child, mm-hmm. human sacrifice, mm-hmm. in my honor, essentially, mm-hmm. or as a, an obedient act unto me. Right. You're okay with that. I have to ask you, are yeah. you okay with that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm okay. How with does what... a moral person become okay right. with that, right? Yeah, I, I'm okay uh, because like in how I just explained. Well, you're if saying it's, if it's it an, was a barbaric time. Yeah, it's an exercise, right? So, it's, But if it's, it's a barbaric time. Right. It doesn't mean that God has to stoop down to the level of the barbarian in order to relate. I mean, he's God. Right. He can make himself aware, make himself known. He, and honestly, knowing everything at all times, he already knew right. the type of faith that Abraham had. The exercise mm-hmm. itself makes no sense to mm-hmm. me. And it makes no sense to a lot of people morally who think mm-hmm. the God of human sacrifice is, is not the God of goodness that they're trying mm-hmm. to sell us from the pulpit. Right. That becomes problematic from a moral point of view. Uh, I think it's a brilliant teaching moment. And so as if I was to use that as the illustration I gave for if a kid comes and says, um, you know, go cut the branch off because I know what's going to happen. I don't think it's immoral of me to do that exercise because what I'm trying to illustrate is the drastic difference if it's an illustration that they're already willing to do because they're uh, culturally understanding that that's typical, I don't think it's wrong for him to enter into time and space and to use the language of the culture as a teaching moment. What was he teaching Abraham by telling him off your kid? Yeah. Well, well no, what's he teaching? Th- that's not the lesson. The lesson is that God provides. All the other gods demand. Every, every god throughout history, right? And that's one of the whoa, differences. Whoa, whoa, of, whoa. Now, this god demands. Mm-hmm. He's a jealous God. He demands loyalty. He's accepted on occasion, even human sacrifice. We get back to the story of Jephthah and his daughter, right? Give me victory in mm-hmm. battle. I will give to you on a burnt offering mm-hmm. the first thing that comes out of the door of my house. Mm-hmm. And go figure. It's his own child. He executes his kid. She volunteers for this, according to the mm-hmm. story, which, again, I don't mm-hmm. buy. But we're looking at it in terms of morality now. Mm-hmm. God doesn't stop and say, this is crazy. Right. Now, what are you thinking? I'm not going to, this is an innocent child. Mm -hmm. God says, fine, you know, the the smoke pleases me, whatever God happens Mm -hmm. to say at the moment. We're talking about a God who does make great demands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he has, especially in the Old Testament, but since Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and Jesus and God are essentially the same cat, right? Mm -hmm. We are talking about a God that is, you know, territorial and jealous and Mm -hmm. has very strict guidelines as to how he wants to be served and Mm -hmm. honored and... So, yeah, he provides, but he provides with a tremendous number of conditions, according to the Bible. Well, yes. and, and, according, and according to Scripture, all those demands are met in Jesus. So let, let me take a, a time out here because I don't want to put the apologist hat on, right? Because okay. well, there would I, be I like, I don't okay, mind. Me, I, yeah, yeah. If, it, if, it's, if it's an argument that you find is a legitimate one and it happens right. to fall under the apologetics umbrella, let's talk about it. Well, it does fall under the apologetics uh, umbrella, but then there's all these presuppositions like you talked about that I think are more at the core than just where, I mean, because if, if I was to do the typical apologetic thing and then there's like eight things, there's, you know, the shotgun of information, look at all these evils. 
I could go, well, how in atheism do you account for evil? And we could go down that road. And then you would present your side and I would say, well, that doesn't show absolute morality. And you could say, well, it's a moral consensus or you can do the Dawkins things. And we can go back and forth. And all of the atheist Christians, they do this dance all the time. And I think one of the things that I find really interesting is that we seem to think that we're neutral, but I think neutrality is a myth. Well, we all have our biases and, you know, a measure of predisposition. I mean, I'm here for a reason. We're having this conversation right, because right. I because I once was a true believer. I mean, I think when you walk into a room, a lot of times you play the card yeah. that, you know, I used to be an atheist. Right. Man, yeah. I was there. I, I right. rejected God mm-hmm. until he revealed himself to me. And now right. I'm I'm all in. And I'm this guy who was all in and felt like it was absolutely true. And I'd never really even mm-hmm. tapped on the aquarium glass to find right. out how true it was. Right. And I was in a culture that discouraged questions. They say, ask mm-hmm. questions. But if you came mm-hmm. back with an answer that was not Jesus, right. it's my fault. I'm doing it wrong. I'm being deceived. I've lost my mind. Yeah. Um, or they make it about me. Uh, Seth's mm-hmm. going through midlife. He's lost his mind. He's, he's uh, an embarrassment to us. He's been infected with evil. Right. As an atheist, I'm, I'm looking at religion and how it had sort of inhibited the way I approached the world, the way I approached my fellow human beings. And I think this is a, a culture that is sort of wrapped up in love language. Yeah. But underneath, there's always that sort of, there's a threat. You know, you don't want to get... You don't want to get cast off, man. You don't want to go. You don't want to get this question wrong because there's, you know, you got hell over here. There's the devil and his minions and everybody's. Mm-hmm. And even culturally, you don't want to tell anybody you're an atheist because look at how they treated so and so. I don't even speak to my mother and father for that reason. There is a culture of division. Believe like us, validate us, endorse us or else. And I that's, could, that's yeah. a problem. So I could uh, frame that the exact opposite way, though, because from what I discovered as I came out of atheism, I felt like uh, as you leave that group, there's, oh, my gosh, now you're dumber than you used to be. Now you're believing nonsense. We're more elevated and smarter. Who's we? And, I'm sorry. And uh, the, the little atheist oh, group okay. of the people yeah, yeah, that, that, you, oh, that wow. you hang around with. He lost his and mind. You're and... no longer a, you know, a free thinker. And so we all have these social groups that we're a part of and uh it can be difficult to leave one but then we find another one and we surround ourselves with people who agree with us we are certainly a a species of tribes we talk a lot very much you know the instincts and how tribalism helped us on the african savannah helped keep us keep us alive right i mean it was it was beneficial for us to band together right and there are a lot of reasons that that happened but i i'm interested in how tribalism is often kept us, it, it just kept conversations like ours right. from happening sometimes, right? Uh, sometimes, but what I, what I do see at, when I look out into the apologetic circle is Christians are more than willing to engage the top thinkers. So we, we have people who aren't necessarily professional apologists. It's not necessarily what they do for a living, but we have astronomers, uh, mathematicians, physicists, um, all these people that are willing to engage this. And, I had the impression. Now, I was an atheist before there were the four horsemen of atheism. You know, uh, we had Anthony Flew, uh, who became a believer eventually. And uh, but I, I liked. Uh, well, he did, not a Christian believer. I'll clarify. He, he became a loose theist. But I had this. There was this overarching message that we are the enlightened one, and I think we both have. There's Christian televangelists and atheist televangelists, and we always go for the low hanging fruit. Uh, oh, absolutely. The, well, I, I, you know, there are certainly people on the front end. There are leaders, communicators, speakers, speakers, educators in both camps. Right. And, and you might call, I just resist that we put these arenas of ideas with people who are helping to spread the ideas always right. in a religious model, mm-hmm. an atheist preacher. You're having an atheist church. You right. are essentially using a religious model, a church model, to frame everybody in who might be standing in opposition to what the church is doing. And I'm not sure I go there. I, I think I know what you mean. Yeah, I, I'm not using it in a derogatory sense. It's just an evangelist as somebody who per, you know perpetuates an idea or a philosophy contrasting it to other worldviews. But it's not an authoritarian model necessarily where what you say from – 
you know, at a secular convention is going to be challenged and rechallenged, and people are, are in a culture that encourages skepticism to go and dissect and take it apart. There's some of that in the church. Oh, I... But the authoritarian model in the church, to look up to a shepherd as a member of the flock, to follow their leadership, that's a lot more prevalent in religious circles. I think it's just as prevalent in atheism. I heard Dan Barker um, not too long ago and he's addressing the crowd. He says, come on, you are smart people. You all know this. If you're smart, you know this, right? And he's talking about everybody knows there's no God. And he's speaking very, you know, authoritarian. You just know this. Intentionally. You know no, there's no God. that doesn't sound like Dan Barker. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's a buddy of mine. Yeah. To say yeah. every, to tell everybody else what they know. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard him say that, you know, all you have to do is walk into a children's hospital mm-hmm. to know that there yeah. is no God. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think the argument from needless suffering or what some people call the argument from evil is a, right. it's a pretty good argument. It's certainly not a complete one. Right. Um, Which I think is from the atheist perspective. I think the problem with evil is one of the most difficult ones for believers to wrestle with. And what I would like to see is people more engage in that argument in a deeper philosophical form instead of just going... See, because there's a sick kid in the hospital, there is no God. Well, there's great people who have wrestled with those ideas. They're intelligent, they're thoughtful, they're consistent, but yet they haven't made this leap to atheism. And so it, it, I, don't, I, I know it's something that should be wrestled with, and it's okay for Christians to say, I don't know. We can talk right. about the argument itself, though. I think, isn't it a meritorious argument to say, that if, you know, you saw your one of your mm-hmm. children who was yeah. suffering mm-hmm. and you had the power to intervene and, and mm-hmm. heal, to save, to rescue, to prevent violence mm-hmm. against them, to do something positive, to mm-hmm. intervene, yeah. you as a moral creature are right there. Mm-hmm. Right. And yet our standard for God is mm-hmm. to defer and say, ah, you know, whatever he wants to do is what he wants to do. And yeah. so if my child dies of leukemia. Mm-hmm. Or if a tsunami kills 250,000 people or on a planet that's supposedly right. designed for us, if any of these horrible things happen in the world, you know, I see believers as they have a get out of jail free card. Now, hear me for just a second and then come after me if you'd like. No, okay? sure, sure. But uh, let's say that I had a child and my mm-hmm. child is in a car accident, right? Mm-hmm. Terrible accident. Mm-hmm. When I was religious, I had a get out of jail free card. I had an mm-hmm. absolute perfect mm-hmm. silly putty moldable mm-hmm. answer for whatever right. the outcome was. If the child escapes with no injury, it's a miracle. He should be dead. Mm-hmm. If he escapes with scratches, it's a miracle. It should have been worse. If he's paralyzed from the waist down, mm-hmm. at least he's alive. God must yeah. have more for him to do. Mm-hmm. And if he dies, God called him home to a better place where there are no car accidents, there is no pain, and one day we'll be mm-hmm. reunited together. Right. So they've created this ever-moving goalpost where no mm-hmm. matter what the outcome is, no mm-hmm. one ever stops to think, why would a God who had, mattered, who had taken a moment to count the hairs on my head mm-hmm. not tell me to turn right instead of left or not prevent this particular vehicle, this drunk driver from flying through the intersection or... Why wouldn't he have created some sort of a warning system for me to keep me safe? Mm -hmm. Why am I operating in a world that seems to operate only by natural laws with no supernatural Mm -hmm. intervention? Mm -hmm. I grow frustrated because those ever-moving goalposts make it nearly Mm -hmm. impossible to pin down Mm -hmm. a God who is supposedly a protector parent. How Mm -hmm. would you respond to that? Well, it depends on the situation. And I I don't want to take lightly because these are – very real situations that I've been a part of. Yeah. Right. I've done funerals for little kids. I got asked to do a funeral today. That's terrible. I can't um, imagine. Uh, I was visiting with a guy at my church this morning who works at the NICU and they lost a kid that was just born. Uh-huh. Um, the heart was fully formed, but the lungs weren't. And the eyes, the brain was fully functioning. And as the child was passing away, it was registering its parents. And he's a believer and so was the father. And neither of them stopped being believers afterwards. So, I mean, like the reality of these situations are one we use for argumentation, but they're, it's a gut wrenching reality. I've lost a child. Oh, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. No, I, mean, I didn't, trust I didn't me, it doesn't, it, you know, realize that when I asked the but question. I don't, I don't throw that out there as sympathy. I don't want to answer the question. It's just a reality where I, as a believer, I mean, I'm a preacher. God, I get, I get first, you know, like you owe me, right? I work for you and I, you know, you should fix this situation. 
And so these are things that we wrestle with on a very real, but also very intellectual thing. I don't, I have no time for fairy tales and I don't want to scapegoat answers. And so as I've wrestled with it personally, if you allow me to tell just a a short story to illustrate something that I don't necessarily understand, and then I'll give you the apologetic. Okay. So I'll kind of give you my defense. I was at a church and there was a woman who was dying of cancer. Her uh, kids were about to get married. She hadn't been well enough to come to church. She came for one last Sunday wearing a bandana over her head to cover her bald head. And she's talking about how her relationship with God has been infected by this disease. And uh, she said, very honestly, very sincerely, having to take lots of breaks to drink water because her mouth was dry from medication, she says, I've come to know God so much through this that if I had the option to go back and not get cancer, I wouldn't do it because the value of knowing him is greater than my sickness. And I said, I don't get that. So that that's the story. I, I, I heard that and I go, no, I would always go back. Now, before you interject, so the apologetic of it, as I was talking with this guy who just saw a child pass away today. He says, how do you maintain any kind of faith in that? And we began to have a discussion about the moral goodness of God. I say, if you had, I use the exact same argument you used. I says, if God has the ability to stop it, why doesn't he? And because his power is so supreme, because he could not only interject in that, he could interject in any evil. Where do we draw the line then? I say, okay, if you're going to, um, save this baby, then save all babies. If you're going to protect them from this sickness, then you have to protect them from any harm. If you're going to protect them from any harm, any misdeed, if you have to protect them from any misdeed, protect them from any bad thought, you have total power. So take total control and all of a sudden you remove the free will. No, you don't. Sure. No, you don't. Sure. You're Look, going to have to draw the line and you're going to say, God, I want you to draw the line with my child. But don't draw the line with any other situation where evil might have or sickness or badness. It's I'm going to because it's our personal child. Of course, we want him to intervene. Right. I I just don't buy it. It, Let let me tell you why. Um, First of all, you know, I'm speaking. I think we're speaking about the same God. You know, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it that the Father might be glorified in the Son. I mean, God is a God of miracles. God is a God of answered prayer. If you believe the New Testament. Mm -hmm. You believe that Jesus walked around healing all kinds of maladies. He even raised the dead, right? right? And so the idea that he would make a promise to us that, you know, if we come together that, that and petition him, that he will be there for us in our hour of need, right. and then to leave us scrambling right. and wondering where he is, that for me, becomes hugely problematic. And again, we're presupposing the existence of Jesus. Right, right, yeah. I'm not saying I'm a Jesus mythicist necessarily. There may right. have been a guy that I think the story was based on. But I, I have uh, I have an interesting time trying to reconcile the God who is so concerned about us that we are worth more than the sparrows that might fall from the sky, mm-hmm. but will allow a mother to carry a child for nine months and then lose it in the delivery room, mm-hmm. and then we still give God the glory. Mm-hmm. This, to me, reeks of a kind of slavery, I think emotional and intellectual slavery. And mm-hmm. many people are lauded for this. You know, nothing mm-hmm. broke my faith. Nothing caused me to doubt. I was raised in a culture where doubt is either a sin, it's weakness, or an attack. I mean, we don't raise our kids to say doubt. Which is weird because we 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 share, you know, we shared a a book when you were a believer. We had the Bible. I have the Bible, and the Bible doesn't condemn doubt. It, in fact, tells us to test everything. Come, let us reason together. But, but if I may, I mean, not to interrupt, but you know, when Jesus is chastising. Thomas, he says, you know, the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea that's blown and tossed by the wind. That person shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. I mean, Mm -hmm. he was chastising Thomas Mm -hmm. for saying, look, I'm going to need to see some nail holes and I'm going to need to see the spear. Mm -hmm. I need some evidence that it's really you. Actually, Mm -hmm. Thomas, for that reason, is my favorite disciple because he's like, I need some peer review on this reappearance of you, dude. You know, we call him doubting Thomas. Jesus didn't. Jesus was more than glad to show him his hands. But you understand, though, coming mm-hmm. from Christianity, we live in a right. culture where if you doubt, people start. I mean, you can hear the sirens going off. Wait a minute. Seth has some doubts. There's a problem. There's someone who's off the reservation. He's leaving the camp. He's not with us completely. 
we should just accept that God always knows best. As a pastor, tell me you don't see this yes. culture out there. Yeah, but I don't know if it's a response to uh, biblical theology. I think it is more a cultural ignorance. Like I say, I think a lot of the things that atheists don't like are a reaction to postmodernism, not necessarily Christianity. The, they're no, I, upon, I don't like Christianity. They're basing <laughs> upon, right, right. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, I, if we're going to be honest right, about Right, for sure, um, for sure. Um, but I, from everything that you've said, like, you know, the church does this, the church does this. I say, well, the people in the church might do that, but you can very quickly find places in universities and academia where they're going to challenge every belief you have and they're not going to settle for just passive answers. You can't just say, sure. well, just have Either. faith. They, there, there's the, the history of Christian thought is so deep in such a huge well that I don't think Atheism in some sorts, popular atheism, which thanks to YouTube and all that stuff now, everybody has an opinion and you can follow an atheist. Um, uh, you know, you were, we were talking about, I don't mean to change subjects, but how people love it when I come and they say, oh, he's a former atheist. Both of our sides love it that we change teams, yeah, right? Like, true. oh, you know, it, it, it gets you in the door in some ways. In some ways, though, but I think yeah. it also allows you to speak with some measure of perspective like you yeah. i would hope you don't think many people that i know speak about the caricature of the atheist they don't speak about flesh and blood three-dimensional right. human beings moral right. creatures good human beings who genuinely want goodness there is a, a a caricature of what the atheist is and i think it's the other we're right. back to tribes right we're also back to I need to defeat the caricature of an atheist mm-hmm. because the reality of the atheist is too much for me to digest. Right. Uh, and we see a lot of that in every tribe. But don't you think there, oh, maybe even more so, there's the character of the Christian? There is. In pop culture, have you ever seen uh, an intellectual Christian on a sitcom? It's the Ned Flanders. It's, it's the moron, right? We've had these conversations in my own life. You know, I'm married to a, a believer in God. Right. It blows people's minds. I mean, their heads literally yeah. pop off of their necks. They're like, how is this possible? I would like to see that. It's because well, I only do, I only do <laughs> one show a night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, say, <laughs> you say literally. You say literally. Yeah, yeah. The, the yeah. idea that I would see her first as a flesh and blood human being who mm-hmm. is beautiful right. and someone I want to be with mm-hmm. and someone who lights up my life. Right. I don't love her because she agrees with me. I love her because she's a beautiful human being. Right. And I think, you know, it's it's hard to see. And this is true in atheist circles as well. It's a, it's a conversation we've often had on my radio show that, you know, I wasn't an idiot when I was a believer. Right. You know, I wasn't all these pieces of invective that you're throwing out. I wasn't a bad human being when I was right. a believer. My IQ didn't change one way or the other when I was a believer. These are, we're talking about ideas. Yeah. And I wish we could start talking to each other and treating each other like human beings. I don't have to be like you or agree with you to necessarily connect with you as part of the human experience. Right. And so I would agree. I mean, you and I, we've seen the tribes and how they, the in-group, out-group theme is, right. is fully at play. Uh, Mormons do this thing where as soon as you start challenging, you are labeled anti-Mormon, which is to say that you are an enemy, right? And Christians are often labeled anti-science, as though Christians and Sir Francis Bacon didn't play a major role in helping form the foundation of what we know as science. As though we will go to Ken Ham, who I would chastise along with you, right? You, you go to the ark and there's dinosaurs in there. That is a segment of Christian thinking. And there's a lot of times I think Christians are harder on Christians than even atheists are because there are aspects that should be go, wait a minute, guys. Um, we don't have to believe the world is, you know, five, 6,000 years old. There's a range of thought. And in atheism, there's a range of thought. I haven't asked if you're a naturalistic atheist and, and I go, well, if there's only matter, how do we know that you and I are even have the free will to have this discussion? Right. We're just, you know, like we, there's, there's segments. And I would like to see atheists, when they talk about Christians, talk about the those who have asked themselves the difficult questions. Well, you know, just because a scientist happens to be religious doesn't validate right. a religious argument. Yeah. I mean, you know, we find people who are atheists, but they're not atheists for rational reasons. They right. never mm-hmm. they right. never explored it. They assumed right. that there was no God. They were raised mm-hmm. by atheist parents. It was never a thing in their lives. They 
have never been indoctrinated. None right. of those things come into play. So, right. you know, hey, look, we have Scientist X. We have Francis Collins. Yeah. I mean, that's right. not really an argument as much as it is. Well, we it probably is an argument for it's wrong to say that people are stupid because they are religious, because we know right. that's not the case. We know that there are uh, there were wonderful Christians and terrible Christians. There were wonderful atheists and there were terrible atheists. There were wonderful right. human beings across the spectrum and terrible human beings across the spectrum. I need to come back to a couple of things. By the way, this sure. is a tandem broadcast. Right. Pastor Caleb Moore, Seth Andrews, the resident heathen. I keep waiting for the altar call. Well, I haven't seen one yet. Um, Wait till the end. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Invitation and the plate will, plate will be passed. When I was talking about the culture of people in the church who do this or do that. I was still rooting it, though, in the scriptures. I was rooting it in the idea that, you know, D Jesus wasn't kind to doubters mm -hmm. in the Bible. Um, you know, there there isn't a lot of room. Yes, I, I don't I don't see that. And I've read the Bible many times. I don't see him if as you being read this. If un, I just unkind. quote you the scripture, yeah. you know, the one who doubts yeah. that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. This is a top down culture where they say. You need to believe. Belief comes first. Doubt is a problem. And yet there are so many instances in our lives when doubt is a protective mechanism. The car door opens and some stranger tells your kid, your daughter to get in. I got some candy. Doubt right. saves her life. Somebody says, I can make you a hundred grand with only a $10,000 investment. Our doubt keeps us from right. getting scammed. We use doubt all the time. We use it in terms of other religions, mm -hmm. other political parties. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet there seems to be an edict within scripture born out of the Bible right. that doubt is problematic and we should try to focus more on acceptance, belief, stick with the, the home team. You don't see that? No, no. In fact, uh, when Jesus is talking to Thomas, he's standing in front of him and here he has this person he's known intimately for a long time. He's like, okay, you're there. But it's such a huge claim. I don't, I, you know, I don't think it's wrong for him to doubt because the claim is so big, but he's already sitting in front of him. He's like, all right, I got to put my hand in the holes. And so he had logical reason to believe that Jesus had done what he said he was going to do. He's standing there, but even in the face of evidence, he's not certain. Now he's got to put his finger in a wound. What's the problem? Yeah, no, I don't see one. No, right? what's the problem with Thomas's yeah. action with his request? Yeah. Right. Why would he be chastised by Jesus for just saying, man, you know, I want to know as much as I can know. I want to verify and make sure. Right. Wouldn't that be something that we should applaud in someone like Thomas? Yeah, I, I think so. And I don't think but Thomas Jesus is, did not applaud him. Yeah. Um, I don't think him saying like, hey, because you're doubting you're evil. It's like, look, there are those who are going to believe oh, whether they see me or not. I never said evil. No, no. I, I don't think you're uh, flaky. You're flaky. You're all over the. You are not believing. Belief comes first. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think you know when you come, you when you enter sort of that authoritarian model where the authority yeah. says believe first. Yeah. Don't ask too many questions. See, then you're following up with, well, hey, don't even though. So we're, we're going to zero in on this. Yet, if we take scripture as a whole test everything, see if there's anything good, you know, examine, and, and who gets, um, when people are receiving this information, he compliments the Bereans. He's like, at least you guys are testing to see if anything that I'm saying is actually true or not. Like you're going on your religious history and you have these books and you're hearing this new information. You're taking it and you're examining to see if whether it's true or not. As a, as a Jesus believer, how do you test the veracity of the Jesus story? How do you know? How do you know any of the books of the Bible are what they are, written by who they say they're? Yeah. How do you get to the foundational text of yeah. your faith? Um, who wrote the book of Genesis? Let me, let me. We'll just start simple. Yeah. Who uh, wrote the book of Genesis? We don't know. So we have uh, some good idea. But I don't necessarily need to know. I mean, we say it's attributed to Moses, but we also see evidence that there were editors within it. And I like Bart Ehrman. Uh, I like, uh, I've read his books on like misquoting in Jesus and stuff like that. And Bart Ehrman was taught by a Christian. His mentor, his idol, a guy he looked up to and respected that taught him everything he knows about textual criticism showed Bart all these maybe what some would call errors, um, textual variants in the book. 
But the guy who showed him that never left his faith because we understand those textual variants for what they are. We're aware of them. We see how they work and we understand the process of transmission. We know how it works. And Bart Ehrman, what he is very popular and very well known, especially in your crowd. My listeners, if they don't know, Bart Ehrman uh, was a Christian who studied textual criticism and then became a atheist. He's atheist or agnostic? Does he say he's, which he's an one? Atheist. He, he doesn't yeah. parade it around. Yeah, he doesn't parade it around. He's a historian. He's uh, written a lot of books, and so, that's his yeah. historian is. By the way, uh, textual variance is what we call contradictions. Yeah. Now, well, then you would have to get rid of almost all ancient history. At all. But most ancient history is not positioning itself as an inerrant word of God, the divinely breathed instruction manual for living. Yeah. And well, if you're so, going to call a variant a contradiction, oh, then you're going to say, oh, it's going against it. So this isn't about, is it divinely inspired? It's just asking the question, has this changed over time? And Bart Ehrman says, no, it really hasn't. There might be a few small areas. And, and he says this at the end of his book, after he makes this huge case, he says at the end of, um, it's not uh, misquoting Jesus. It's the one after that. Uh, Jesus interrupted. Yeah, Jesus interrupted. And he said it, um, you know, in person several times that actually we can be very reliable what it says and the places where there's real conjecture don't affect any theology. The reason he doesn't believe is because as a historian, that does not allow for miracles. He says because his field is a historian and historians can't account uh, for miracles, so I don't believe in miracles. But he will at least say that scripture has not been changed over time, especially in any area that would affect theology. Which so that's not a contradiction. That that's a misuse of the words there. Well, if if because the by I don't think he rejects it because it cannot account for miracles. I think he just doesn't buy it. I mean, he's saying you're, they would have to support the idea of miracles more than the claim that a miracle happened. But if you get into even the first two books of the book of Genesis, the order of creation, these are contradictory stories. There were four different conflicting accounts of of uh, Jesus's tomb, his empty tomb. I mean, yeah. if we get into the basics of, of biblical claims, what I often hear from apologists yeah. is, well, it's like reporting. Everybody brought a different perspective. Yeah. And it was all written down. And sure, I mean, some of the stuff looks different, but it's because they were looking at it from different angles. And none of the really important stuff contradicts itself. And I always come back to this idea that a divine creature would give this critical message and place it in the hands of the same species that screwed up everything else in the world. And we would end up now in the year 2019 with literally thousands of different variations of a faith that is born of a God who supposedly is not the author of confusion. Right. I mean, can you think of any religion more confusing than Christianity in the present day? Atheism. <laughs> <laughs> Atheism so, is simply so, the disbelief yes, in yes. God. It is not a religious claim. It is a worldview because you it can is pass not. it on to your children. It, it is not. Think about atheism. Daddy, if, where did the world come from? It didn't come from anywhere. No, no, no. We're not even sure if you actually exist. We, you could be a figment of our imagination. We, Hold on. So let me answer. No, no, no. I'm not, you can't, you right. cannot throw out atheism as a religion and allow me to. I've been very generous, okay? <laughs> right. The idea that someone walks in and makes a positive claim, and I say, I'm not convinced, is not in itself a dogma. Right. It's like, I'm, I'm not convinced. It doesn't make any suppositions about how the world began or whether or not I think there was aliens or whether there was a singularity. or It, it says nothing else. It doesn't even say whether I came to a non-belief in deities rationally. It's simply, it's not making a positive declarative statement. God cannot exist there, there never was a God. Right. I'm, I'm saying I'm just not convinced. I do not believe it. I am an atheist. It's right. not a dogma. It's simply a disbelief. And I, I say that on purpose because I know it riles the feathers it a little bit. It does. It does. It's just because it I hear that, it a lot of times it, from apologists. So right. forgive me. It's a bit of a hot button. Right. Of course. But I'll stand back and, and let you I was clear the air. Because I was thinking about that. Um and I, I want to get to the textual thing right after this. Okay. But if somebody is an atheist and their kid comes to them and starts asking questions, and then the person says, I don't think there's very good evidence for it. They have already put in that kid's mind where the weight, like what the, how good the evidence might be. Right, So they've already said the evidence isn't very good. That is a propagation of a worldview. Well, so you atheism cannot. in itself 
may not be a religion or a worldview as just a simple statement, but it quickly can become one. Short break. When I come back, it's more with Pastor Caleb Moore. We're going to talk about Genesis, the book of Genesis, as poetry. We're going to talk about why Caleb thinks that ethical behavior by non-believers in Christ is a kind of moral plagiarism. Those are his words. We're going to do a little street epistemology with the Bible. And while we're having religious debates, I ask Pastor Caleb Moore about Marvel versus DC. All that and a whole lot more in just a second. Hang on. My patrons get this broadcast totally commercial free and they get the show two days early every single week. Thank you for your support on Patreon at patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. This is the second half of my conversation with local pastor Caleb Moore. We were talking about an atheist worldview and the ability or impossibility of being able to raise kids without predisposing them to our views, our biases, our way of seeing the world. If we, I buy that you can certainly predispose anything you can indoctrinate your children with and you can do this with politics you can do it with whether i'm going to buy ford or chevy right i mean i get that but i think the difference might be and we've done several shows on secular parenting right how do i keep from dogmatically informing what my kid thinks and you know i want to teach them to look both ways before they cross the street i want to teach them not to talk to strangers and i want to teach them not to do this to keep them safe Mm -hmm. i want to teach them to say please and thank you Right. Right. But I don't want to tell them what they philosophically or even theologically feel about the world. How do I avoid that? And it's it's definitely a minefield. But there's a difference between the culture that I was raised in where this is true. Jesus is real. And this is just the way it is, which is how many fundamentalist religious homes are. This is what you think. Right. This is my religion. My parents decided is how the meme goes. And there's a difference between that and saying to a child, this is kind of how I feel and think about it. This is how I fall. I think you're going to have to determine for yourself. Now, this is imperfect, which is sometimes the perfect is the enemy of the good. But to then create a critical thinking process where the child becomes an agent of discovery in his or her world so that you aren't just spoon feeding your worldview, but that they're able to go out and have the critical thinking tools to discern and decide and discover and explore and find out who they are, what they think, and why they think it on their own terms. There's a difference between that and sort of spoon-feeding Jesus into some young child going to, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday school. We all pass on what we think is good and true and right. Now, to the level, if it's just berated, don't question this— then I would say that is faulty. In fact, that's why we see a lot of people when they graduate high school, they graduate their parents' faith as well. So they're well, going they to go suffer. to college and they're introduced yeah. to other ideas. They're and- introduced to other ideas, um, which is a shame that because I believe Christianity is so rich and intellectual that we should introduce people to other ideas. When I took over at this church here, they had a little youth group and I spent uh, the first couple of weeks just talking about different religions. I said, hey, let's look at this religion. Let's look at this religion. Let's, Let's kind of examine all these things. And I always stress people, you can't survive on your parents' faith. You have to ask the question, is this what you believe? And I, I truly believe as people will, if they will look into it and think deeply about it, I think truth is a person. Now, you were talking about the Bible and the how the gospel narratives about the resurrection are contradictory. And to me, I'm just, I'm almost flabbergasted. I was like, that to me is dealing with the low level, that the low hanging fruit, instead of reaching up to academia, where we know uh, the type of literature that it is, is Greco-Roman biography. We know that. Does everyone we, know that? Well, hopefully... Does they, the lowest common denominator who hasn't been to seminary, who picks up the Bible and expects I, God to take us at his word, do they know all that? 
Well, I'm the lowest. Co- I don't have any college degree, and I've never been to seminary. Oh, but right? you've, so you've, I was you're able a to student figure of Scripture because I ask questions. So I, if people aren't willing to ask questions, there's not too much I can help them with. Is it too much for mm-hmm. us to expect a God to not contradict Himself, a yeah. perfect God? Yeah, I see. I don't think He does. So if He's writing, uh, but if in the stories the don't agree, style, isn't that a contradiction? How, yeah. And if he has the power to correct the author who was putting pen to paper and say, this is actually a contradiction, you need to get your facts right. This is that presuppositional idea that you're presupposing it should look like a 20th century textbook. I, God, I want you to write that for me now. It should, it should just look like something that agrees with itself. I, I think I'm not saying it has to look like any particular century, decades. It has to, to reflect a, a specific style. Is it in agreement with itself as a, perf- a perfect document should be. And if it starts to disagree, is this not a revelation that we're looking at a text that was created by different people in different eras, all with different agendas, human beings with human agendas creating the texts saying that they were inspired in the name of God to do so. The agenda of the disciples to say these things must have been to get themselves killed because they knew that was most likely what would happen. But if you look and, at the New Testament and the Gospels themselves, I mean, we see the authorship of those are what, 40 years after the supposed death of Jesus Christ? I mean, it's maybe not, it's 35. It's, it's not eyewitness reporting, right? I mean, the, the Gospels are written in the third person. Yeah, it, they're not even written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mm-hmm. and so you know the idea that we automatically say that well, well, of course it happened. I mean, and these people died, mm-hmm. isn't the first question we ask? Hey, wait a minute, did the story actually happen? Is it based in mm-hmm. truth? And how do we know if it's true or not? And See, if we don't know, yeah, I don't want to. I, I can't concede those points because I think it doesn't deal with the real scholarship where we say, yeah, they didn't write their name on it. Of course, Paul did. But Matthew doesn't put Matthew, John doesn't put John, but most people didn't when they're writing those type of letters. So it's totally consistent. And then we bring in this whole new methodology and we say, speak my language or I don't believe it. Okay. So, and if- so it speaks, it speaks historically accurate methodology for the people that understood it at the time. And we agree with that when it comes to any other issue. The real fact is, is it has a miracle in it and we don't like the miracle. So then we'll look at it with a, it's a hyper skepticism that says, well, sure, I'll understand Alexander the Great and it might have these things that I don't agree with the the form that they wrote it in. They're not necessarily worried about chronology the way we are. Well, I don't hold, um, you know, I don't hold Socrates, Aristotle. I don't hold, right. you know, Homer. I don't hold these authors to the same standard as the perfect God who is selling perfection. And so when I see flaws or contradictions or reflections of a pretty superstitious and barbaric time period in human history, I'm like, well, of course, I mean, of course, it it looks barbaric. Of course, there was human sacrifice. Of course, there were horrible, bloody tribal wars. Of course, there was racism and slavery. And of course, so women different were different from today. Huh? We, we, there were so, you know, women were worth so much less than men, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you see that in others and you're like, yeah, well, we look at the Bible and somehow we're supposed to then defer and say, I accept it as the truth of a God instead of a reflection of, again, a very barbaric and superstitious time where people were extremely caught up in mythology, gods, devils, um, punishment, damnation, uh, holy wars, those types of things. I, I feel like you described the last 10 years. Right. I, so I, you say, oh, it's such a barbaric, ignorant time. We, we, we're awfully proud of ourselves these days and we're awfully um, self-congratulatory about our intellect. There's extremely intellectual people in those times as well. And there's areas and times where they're not barbaric and there's not holy wars. And yet, oh, come on, that's a deflection, Caleb. No, I'm just saying we, if if you're saying, oh yeah, you know, they only roasted people over the open flame over in this zip code. But over here, they are going to disagree on this, but I would say we still are sacrificing children at the altar. It's just a different altar. So if we look at, though, a time period when people thought the earth had corners, right? Mm -hmm. We look at a time period when people felt like they had to to rest the heart out of a out of a sacrifice to make the sun rise as the I think it was the Mayans did on their temples. If, If you look overall at humanity, 
we have a tremendously problematic and occasionally extremely violent world today, but this yeah. is not the world of our ancestors. If you read like uh, Steven Pinker's got a tremendous book called The Better Angels of Our Nature that talks mm-hmm. about how that despite the fact that in the Twitterverse we see the minute by minute awfulness that people have done to each other, overall we have less sickness, we have less famine, we have less suffering, we have less war. Uh, certainly tribal wars, we are less bloodthirsty. We're not putting people in the Coliseum in the middle of New York City and letting tigers eat one religion or another anymore. So while we have our problems, we have evolved. We, our knowledge has evolved. We do have flat earthers. <laughs> we, how does that happen, Kate? <laughs> I, uh, I, have I you seen the documentary? Oh, yes. Okay. And, and so, and this is how I want to be cynical. So I watch that. And I go, it is incredible at the level that we can be self-deceiving. I met a flat earther one day, and uh, he was at a comic book convention. So uh, we were talking. He says, oh, I'm a Christian too. And then he goes into, so do you know the earth is flat? And I go, whoa, 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 buddy. Look, I know what I believe to the outside world already sounds weird enough, don't start throwing that out there. I was like, so if you're gonna, if if you want to tell people about Jesus, please keep your mouth shut about flat Earth. But uh, the, the level of self deception is is still extremely. It's amazing. It's amazing. When you see the documentary, you see though that they come together in a kind of an insular tribe. Got their community. They don't allow anybody else really to infiltrate with bad ideas, and they've got a very much us versus the other mentality. Right. But in going back to the Bible, I mean, the Bible, if you look at the early verses of Genesis, it says that there was, uh, uh, that the earth has a firmament over it. I mean, that makes no sense. You know, there's all kinds of weird claims about the nature of the earth that, you know, don't reconcile, reconcile with the real world. Right. The, the scientific method was not even known. They're not writing a science book. But God knew majority, everything. Yes. God knows everything, and he is breathing those words onto the page yes. through his proxy. Absolutely. So why in the world doesn't God yeah. say, hey, it's a sphere? Because they don't care. It's not relevant to the story. Like, you, Accuracy you see, isn't it's relevant? All, it's all these, it's again, um, I want it to be a history book. I want it to be a science book. I just want it's, it to be it's a in story. conflict or it, not in conflict with, yeah. with reality. Well, if you take Shakespeare and you throw it in a completely different arena, then you can be upset at Shakespeare. But if Genesis is poetry. Sha- Shakespeare's it, not, not saying he's God and then I have to pledge my lifelong allegiance to him. With an eternal but consequence. Just, if we in want place, to be intellectually honest, it's understanding the literary form and I, taking it at that I, form. I am not taking the You're, Bible as yeah. a, merely a work of literature. It is a divinely breathed, perfect instruction manual for living. That's how it's been sold through the ages. It's uh, the term inerrancy is not in Scripture. You are not God concerned at all about is. an errant Bible. I, I need to know. I, right. What I'm trying to find out is what is your standard? for God's instruction manual. Do you do you think errors from a perfect God make sense? I don't take it literally. I take it literarily. What do which you means mean? that it has so if Genesis is predominantly poetry and it is uh, just saying, hey, God created this. It's not saying, here's the literal what he did on one day. I don't you, some people hold to that. And it I doesn't, don't necessarily doesn't don't. matter who wrote it. Doesn't matter when it was written, how it was written the foundation. If it, was, if it was written yesterday, that might matter. The cre- the creation yeah. of the book, the found. I mean, mm-hmm. dis- discerning the source of the material. Mm-hmm. Should this not be paramount for us? Who did write it? You know, who certainly wasn't an eyewitness to when the waters were over the surface of the deep, and that mm-hmm. God said, "Let there be light." Right. And there was no eyewitness alive at that moment. Um, one of the great questions I've always heard is, if God created the sun on the fourth day. But you require the rotation of the earth in relation to the sun to have a day. How had four days already passed? We can get into those kind of questions. But well, those are what I ask people who believe in a young earth, right? So yeah, yeah. I, I would say um, the literary forms, I don't think people in your position give enough credence to the level of heavy lifting that goes on in understanding those things accurately. So you, they're not written in a void. And then we want to throw all these things and say, well, in order for me to believe it, I need this, 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 and this. 
But we don't do that with other historical documents to say, hey, at least it fits the form. Well, but whether it, we believe whether it happened or not, it's historically accurate in the way they would have understood it. But so there are no corroborating history books that have other eyewitnesses saying that God said, let there be light. I mean, you've got the Bible. So then you're quoting right. the Bible to prove the Bible, which yeah. is kind of like quoting the Koran to prove the Koran or the Vedas to prove the Vedas. I mean, what other book do we use that? Suppose, supposedly proves itself, that becomes a little bit problematic. Shouldn't we seek outside corroboration that this is really uh, the truth? Well, I, I don't disqualify the Bible as a historical book, so I don't give that because it's written in the context of other historical documents. And whose so there author are you other, don't realize, whose, there, whose author you don't know. That's right. it. Mm-hmm. So it's a history book, and we don't know who wrote it. We can't source it, but it's... We're not, a, we're not a hundred percent certain about certain books because they didn't put their name on it, but we have good guesses, strong leanings that there's no reason to doubt the historicity of the claims made about, and, and you, it's like you go to a seminary. Um, I, I know a few professors. These are things that they talk about, but it, it's not like a destructive thing to the faith to go, Oh, well, we don't know who wrote it, so we throw it out. And so that seems to be more of an aha on your side. No, no, I, I don't think it's an, I don't think it's throw it out. It's how do I, as a neutral observer, try right. to verify the claims made if it's only written in the Bible? And it's one of many books that have creation stories that involve mm-hmm. supernatural things. Of course, we can speak to Islam and, mm-hmm. and uh, Hinduism and all those. If I'm a neutral observer, how do I not then take the Quran's origin story or the Vedas origin story and say, well, you know, it's, it's the history book for my religion and therefore it is true. As a neutral observer, how would I tell the difference? How would I choose? Right. As we said before, the myth ne- neutrality, but that's a side point. Uh, you and know for, what for I mean? Me, okay. So the, uh, the historicity of Jesus, if Jesus was who he said he was, then I think that would make a strong argument for the validity of the rest of Scripture. If Jesus actually was and did who he said he was. And you, you kind of mentioned that you might be off. You're not in the mysticism camp, but... We I don't have, know. I, I just don't know. I mean, we've know. got... We know that Jesus existed. The, we, we can How do you know, know that? that? How do you know? Tacticus, Pliny the Younger, Josephus. So we have non-Christian historians writing not too far afterwards who talk about... Jesus, right? I know Herman's a Jesus literalist or historicist. Um, But, you know, we're also talking about a a time when everybody had their gods and their gods bigger than your God. My dad can Mm -hmm. beat up your dad kind of gods. Uh, We know that there were celestial deities and there were a lot of different things that were borrowed from one deity to the other. I, I need more than a book that is supposed to prove itself to know that Jesus was not just alive, to me, whether he was a man or not is incidental. The God-man Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Did, did the God-man Jesus uh, arrive? And then even if I was to go there, now that opens up a whole other can of worms. Right. And uh, the idea that uh, Bart Ehrman would say, yes, Jesus was a real person. I just don't think he rose from the dead. It is by far the best explanation for why Christianity exploded uh, because I'm going to take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, written as they are in the literary form that is they are, as interviewing eyewitnesses, talking with people who are disciples of John, who have firsthand experience with all this information, saying, we saw a dead guy come back to life. And all of a sudden they go from being, you know, disbanded and upset to willing to die for their faith. Now, lots of people in religions die for their faith. That, that's that's not uncommon. People will fly a building, uh, a, a plane, plane into, into a, a building, building yeah. for their faith. Yeah. Uh, but there's a thing that separates them from all the other people who are martyred. Everybody else dies for what they hope to see. They're going to be greeted by all these virgins and all this stuff. The disciples died for what they claim to have seen. They're not gaining power, popularity, wives, money. They're not gaining any of this kind of thing that would, you know, motivate somebody to lie on that behalf. They didn't it, prosper doing it. Isn't really yeah. validation that it happened. And 
if I was to quote you the Quran to tell you that, you know, Allah is the only God and Muhammad is his prophet, and I was yeah. sort of selling that narrative, would you accept the Quran then as God's perfect word or God's instruction manual for living and the Quranic teachings using the same rules that you're using with the Bible? Yeah, I, I've I've read the Quran uh, when I I'm was, sorry, because that's you know, a boring is, book. Uh, I've read the Book of Mormon. If you want to get even more boring, as Mark Twain, <laughs> Mark, Mark Twain says, it's like chewing tinfoil. Um, it's uh, sort of Somonex for the eyes. Yes. Actually, uh, yeah. I read the Bhakti Vita and I, I all in this search of um, I'm saying if I out, use those yeah. rules, so, though, yeah. if I use the same criteria that you're using yeah. for the Bible right. and say well, they had no reason to lie right. and many of them paid with their lives according to the stories right. and I accept it, would you then accept my faith claims regarding Islam or my religious claims regarding Islam? I think there's historical inconsistencies in the Quran. Contradictions. And we're talking about, yeah, coming um, textual variants. Much, much later. Not textual variants, because there's, there's a difference between contradictions and textual variants. A textual variant is if you write a word twice. We have a manuscript where a guy falls asleep while he's writing and we see his pen drift off. But, but I haven't been talking single, about, yeah, I haven't been talking about duplications and textual right. or duplications in words or nouns, verbs. I've been talking about, that there are contradictory stories being told, sometimes even within the same books or chapters. Those aren't textual variants. They are changes in a story to alter the outcome of the story in a book that is supposed to be perfect. And so I'm asking, you know, with your acceptance of the Bible, if I was a neutral observer and, and someone came to me and they were pitching the Quran or the Vedas using your criteria, what do you think? I mean, how would I tell the difference? How would I know which one to hold on to? Textual criticism plays a lot. And so where you come in and I'm still, I'm, I can't let it slide because I think it's just highly inaccurate. And like, well, it gives, you know, the resurrection account of Jesus. So we have, did it happen at this time of day or at this time of day? Who was there words, first? Who was there that? How did Judas betray him? How did Judas Ju die? These are basics. We have... Uh, what we want is the newspaper article. What we get is a portrait. So like, a, a, and I know you've heard this, right? So a painting is different than a photograph and you're going to choose to uh, say certain things in a different way to communicate to your audience. And it was not wrong for them to do that because that was how the people who received it would have understood it. We have a, a, a manuscript on how to write history from the days of Jesus, right? So there was a, a historian, and he was basically writing on how to write biographies. And he was saying, we're not worried so much about chronology and every single little detail or even certain consistencies. What we're worried about is communicating the character of the person that we're talking about. So like the Gospel of John is focusing on the person of Jesus. So other side characters fall away and don't get mentioned. In other places, they're trying to do different things. And we see some characters step more into the limelight. But for most of the contradictions, they can be ratified. And the other ones, they can't. And that's okay because we understand the way they are writing as far as textual criticism is concerned. So if there seems to be a discrepancy, I'm not, I'm not, like, I'm not upset about it and it doesn't impact how I read it. I understand what they're doing. And I'm going to grant them the ability to write for the people they're writing to instead of interjecting a 20th century model, especially Western model. I don't think accuracy is a, is a modern model. Accuracy is simply the idea that a book that is supposedly divinely true. I mean, which is a true book. Is the Bible true? Yeah. If I was to say I had a great time meeting you, and then when I got home and I told my wife, I had a great time meeting you and your dog. No, I'm both, sorry. Both are true. Now, now you're skating like right. an apologist. You're skating because I'm not talking about. You use the term apologist in a derogatory way. I do. When... I don't. I I don't think that a God who really cared about me needs an apologist. Why would God need some human being to explain what He really means? If God cares about me, and He has the power to conjure the universe, I would. I. I mean, I've asked this many times. Yeah, I remember when I was coming out of my faith, you know, part the curtain of the sky for me and, you know, make sense and tell me what it is that's going on. And a God that genuinely cares about me instead 
has apologists, most of who can't agree with each other about the basics. They don't agree on the nature of baptism, eternal salvation, whether you get the Holy Spirit when you're saved or do you have to say a separate prayer, the nature of hell or whether hell even exists. These are the basics, and apologists chew each other to ribbons over it. Why am I stuck talking to the apologist? I'm desperate for a message from the source. Why do you think God needs a human being to explain him? Well, I don't think he needs one, but I think because we're so stubborn, sometimes he sends people along to help us overcome barriers. Why and send people? There's nothing wrong with. Well, this is we this sinned is the old in the fact. garden. It's like God, I we, want. We screwed up the world and had to be drowned. No. We required a human sacrifice on the cross. We are so corrupt. We've gotten everything wrong. Why is he still? relying on dance proxies. for me god show me write my name in the sky Just, and we would figure out a way to go you know what that's that's airplane but let me say i, I, I think don't, I don't he buy has. that i don't buy that either because when i was coming out of atheism and i'm trying to figure out i wasn't looking for god i wasn't looking I was, for atheism so i i totally I, I would admit from the very beginning and i'm glad to i had emotional experience that changed me to theism but i've had lots of emotional experiences that were wrong so I began to look at, okay, so here's the world that exists. Is there a God that explains this, right? And we use things like, we talk about presuppositions. I know you've had some conversations about this, but I think uh, this is really stuff that atheists need to wrestle with. We use reason a lot. And we're using logic. These things are immaterial, unchanging, and universal. The God of Scripture fits that description. I'm, and if we I, have that's the historical a, That's a claim. Things, that's a claim. It, it's nothing that I know. It's a claim you're making. I'm asking, though, that if he is the God who has counted the hairs on my head, who has cared so much for me that he would sacrifice his son on my behalf, yeah. he would know what I would need to believe in him. Right? He's God. He knows everything. He would already know what it would take to convince me. Mm-hmm. Why do you think I haven't experienced that? Yeah, and that, that's a question I was wondering i'm like what is it that you think would it take because hey the fact that we're talking about a guy that lived two thousand years ago in a small the fact that we're discussing this right that he has made himself so evident that we have more new testament manuscripts than any other historical manuscripts that, that we look at the laws of not just logic mathematics everything for rational conversation to take place would require, and I know you might not give into this, but without some kind of being outside of time, space, and matter, logic and reasoning cannot just exist in our minds. It's well, not a social the, construct. That's a deistic position, not a. Well, the not atheistic really an ones argument. they are axiomatic. We just take them because they're foundational and they work. Well, they they work Which is because they've been the tested and verified right. to work. Now you and know, they worked before the, they were the tested. Problem, they the pr- work because they reflect the supernatural world that we live if in. If you haven't tested them, you can't tell me that they worked because you simply do not know. We know that they worked because we tested them. So I don't start with the presupposition that they worked. I think you start with experimentation. You start by working it out. And within How do the you reality, test logic without logic? It, See, we presuppose logic in order to even have a rational discussion. It's true that we can't really solve, solve the problem of what uh, my friend Matt Dillahunty likes to call hard solipsism when he's speaking about this. Yes. How can we know something beyond our own minds? And the truth is, is that it's, it is difficult for us because we can't prove that we're not all in the matrix. We're not all plugged into the matrix and this is all a simulation and the philosophers will have a field day with that. But I can test the rules of the reality that I live in, and I know that this plus this equals this, and I know that this measures to this, and this reacts this way against this. And that's where we start. We experiment within the reality that we are in, and that's the best we've got. But to then take the leap that the reality exists because it was conjured by what is essentially a divine wizard, if you will, a a deity, a God figure who has a proper name, who then wants a personal relationship with me personally. Mm -hmm. Out of all the hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe, he picked me. That's a huge leap that not all of us are prepared to make, especially on faith. Mm -hmm. We would like it to be demonstrated why Mm -hmm. we should take such a leap. And uh, I I think a worthy deity would welcome those questions. He'd be like, Mm -hmm. you know what? You're absolutely right. It's on me to properly prove myself to a being who needs this kind of understanding, right? The the kind of default, well, they're just axiomatic. Um, 
I think it just removes any chance. You've taken the system you're using to figure out whether there's a God or not, you've using the wrong system. You're not even allowing to say, well, I don't know how reason, I don't even know if I exist. And I, I didn't can't, say that. Well, I like that we could be a brain in a vat and those conversations, I always, I'm, I'm sure you find those boring. It's like, how do we They're know? They're a little tedious. How yeah. do we know we're not really here? I'm like, well, who am I talking to? Right? I think we operate as, as entities in the reality that we live in. And I believe that, you know, we are able to operate, act and react in a natural world. Yeah. Right. You and I are sitting across mm-hmm. from each other. I have no reason to think that we aren't. Right. I have no reason to think that we are a brain in a vat that we're plugged into the matrix. Right. I operate based on faith. The is it faith if I reach over and right. shake your hand? Well, it could be. We uh, have contact. It could be electrical signals sent from the computer into what your could or should I mean, what you could or should have. You yeah. can abstract yourself right. into madness, right. Right. but I don't automatically shake your hand and say the reason that you and I are here sharing this space together is because you were conjured by a deity who now says that, you know, humankind are his adopted children. That's Mm -hmm. a big leap. Yeah. yeah. And I understand why it's attractive to people. Mm -hmm. I understand the appeal of religious belief and faith. I understand why it's hard to leave, especially when it becomes your community, becomes your way of life, when it alleviates the fears about death. I mean, a temporary life for many people can be scary. And I think that brings me to the next question that I have. When you look at me as somebody who doesn't hold to a heaven right, or a hell, certainly, mm-hmm. uh, who, who really thinks the universe doesn't care if I exist, mm-hmm. but I, I am alive. I have a mm-hmm. few decades, hopefully, here on this earth. Do you think my life's worth living, Caleb? Do you think my life has value? Yeah. I mean, look, we're, we've just met each other. And I'm not basing my opinion on you based upon what certain tenets or if you agree with me or not. Yeah. You have value because like me and all other human beings, we're created in the image of God. We're imagers of God. And so I would say, of course, you're a person of worth and value. And I see that. Now, you don't need to be a Christian to believe that. But I think as um, many philosophers would say, that is... A foundation that Christianity gives that if atheism were true, then why value other people? Why, why not conquer, kill? And I don't, I'm not going, I, yeah. I, I want to be careful and not go into if you're an atheist, then you should be doing this. Because I think atheists can have a very strong moral code. And I think they can never believe in God and be nice and generous. But in some ways, I think that's like moral plagiarism. They can live all that out, but they have to sit on the lap of God to slap them in the face. So you're saying that if I'm, if I love my wife or if I'm charitable in my, my heart, if I have joy and goodness and all the stuff we want out of this existence, and I do so without a religious backstory, without a religious belief, I have to borrow from your God. I have to borrow those things from the one who created them. I Don't think, let me put words no, in your mouth. No. You, you tell me if that's inaccurate. No, you're the, the ultimate justification for why you want to be good and why you recognize other people have worth and value doesn't come from a naturalistic worldview. That's a claim, doesn't. but how do, you, how do you prove that? Uh, well, if naturalism is true, right, um, and there is no God, then you have a computer over here. Uh, the outside of it is... The hardware inside is the software, and you do input. If there is no God, then I'm just advanced instincts of my DNA. I'm pre-programmed. This is my computer. My DNA is a software, and whatever you say is the input, and I can't help but choose how I respond. So if somebody is violent, that's just that's just their nature. They can't yeah. help it. Well, because there might be some people in your audience. Are you good for time? I mean, we're just we're just going. Yeah, I got a few more minutes. Yeah. Um, because there might be some people in uh, your audience, especially who may wonder about the where do your morals come from how can you be good without god you know it's not how can you be good without god it's how do we justify um ultimate morality that there is a a moral foundation because you can be good without god but what is the ultimate justification the idea that we would first of all and, and you know when i came out of the faith i remember looking around thinking if i'm only good because i i'm supposed to be 
or because I'm seeking another jewel in my crown, or I, I fear divine punishment because I was commanded to be good. Mm-hmm. How much value does that really have? But if I see me as part of the human species, and we evolved where cooperation benefited us, mm-hmm. where you know, those who cooperated together were the ones who survived and thrived, and you begin to see us, you know, our brains coding for cooperation in our lives. We see communities, we see tribes, we see cities, we see cultures emerging out of that. And then the pleasure that comes with benefiting each other, helping each other, growing together. Everybody wins. This also explains altruistic behavior where it doesn't necessarily automatically come back to me. We can easily explain ethical models, the models for acting in beneficial ways toward our fellow human beings. And we don't have to have a divine judge to be up there saying, be kind to one another, love one another, do this, do that. I certainly don't have to have an expectation of, of streets of gold, pearly gates, jewels in my crown, but doing it simply because it's the right thing to do. And in my own life, as a non-believer in, in supernatural claims, being good for its own sake has been much more rewarding for me. I, I get to live on this planet for a short amount of time. I don't have a belief that I'll live on, but in some ways that has made my life more urgent. Every minute is more urgent. Knowing that there's not an eternity where everything that might happen will happen. I need to say the words today. I need to take the chances today. I need to be the person I should be today because there may be no tomorrow. And if it doesn't matter to the universe, it's okay. It still matters to me. It still matters to those in my life. Uh, Why would I need a deity to have goodness? Well, you don't. And this is the, this is that, that framing issue that we come across. Why do I need a God to, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I can be good without, and I don't need to have this fear of hell or the reward of heaven to be good. That's never why scripture, t- like, tells us foundationally to be good. It just says, you're created in the image of God. Okay. You're, you're a human being. All right. And well, so. If you say that, that well, hold on. it's me, good on me, merit, then you're saying that the, the construction of goodness. You say we, we're, we're tribal and we help each other out and this is, can be done without, but we also come together as a tribe and destroy that tribe over there. That's true. Right? We, we, we kill these people so we can, you, you know, you look at some of the most successful civilizations have done it by destroying lots and lots of people. So but, oftentimes when people come together, it's, not good. Well, they came together and they decided that it was okay. And so I guess that was a moral thing to do. There's a real moral dilemma when it comes to atheism. No, I, I think the challenge that you're speaking to relate back to tribes. And if you look at the, especially the Old Testament, you have hordes of, you have rivers of blood with one of God's army slaughtering the others and not just the soldiers, slaughtering their wives, their children, their infants, their unborn children. In the name of goodness, in the name of justice, in God's name. And I don't think that that is a reflection on God because I don't buy that that God exists. I'm not convinced. I think we're looking at a text written in a superstitious time in the relatively early evolution of civilization where human beings were still coming out of their primitive selves. I mean, we're much better today at understanding uh, why we do what we do, how the human brain works, why we are often tribal and territorial, the things that protected us on the African savanna, much of the savagery even that helped protect us out there that has no place in 21st century living. And we have come to that understanding and we've become much better for it. We have evolved out of our primitive ancestry. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think religions reflect a time in human history when we killed each other for all manner of reasons. And uh, we've evolved past those. That's why we don't have the Colosseums. That's why we're not seeing God's armies, you know, trotting across the United States, slaughtering one church, slaughtering another. It doesn't happen anymore. I would say a lot of the benefits of what we experience are due to Christianity. Universities, you talk about the Ivy League schools that started as seminaries, the printing press, education, the rights of women, the rights of people of different colors. Did did God make those or did human beings make those in the name of God. These come from the ideals presented in scripture, right? Like we made biblical arguments against slavery. One of the things when I was an atheist, I used to say, God, you know, he ordered the slaughtering of the Canaanites and he was for slavery. And then I actually took 10 minutes to look into that. 
And I go, oh no, that's hyperbolic language because then we see what happens to the Canaanites right afterward Caleb, that they are not look, slaughtered. You know, when, when we sang the song as children, mm. that Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came a tumbling yeah. down, yeah. it didn't tell us kids what happened after the walls came down right. when the soldiers went in and executed pregnant right. mothers right. in the name of God. Yeah. That's in the Bible. It's for anybody who cares to look. Yeah, there's a great book, Is God a Moral Monster? If you look at me and you say, mm-hmm. well, God was using the culture and sort of the societal temperature of those times to best teach a lesson in his name in that particular mm-hmm. style because that time period would only hear that kind of message. You understand how it sounds. I, I was using that as a reference to literary forms. Um no, you were talking about, talking Abraham, about Abraham, Isaac. Yeah, and that he's using that language, but you notice he didn't actually uh, kill Isaac. And there are some... No, I'm t- but what about the pregnant yeah. mothers? Yeah, there's there's some really atrocious things that Christians have to wrestle with. You say that the Bible and, is not a slavery book, but the Bible not only says that you can own slaves in Exodus chapter 21, but it gives you instructions no. as to how hard you can beat your slave. Seth, this is... No, no, no. Is, if yeah. the Bible says you can beat your slave to the point where yeah. as long as he gets up off the ground within 48 hours, right. you haven't broken the law. Right. This is something that a moral creature must, yeah. must approach honestly. How do you approach something like that? Well, there are... Not laws about um, you should have slaves and you should beat them, which is what atheists would often say. No, They're, no, 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 no. It gives instructions to masters, yeah. though, and how they can treat other human beings as property, including physical force. Yeah, the, Do you think that a moral deity would is, ever allow you to yeah. own and beat another human being as property? We have laws in our society that if somebody commits a crime, right, they're punished. I'm not talking about crime. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm talking... Well, I'm not talking what, about uh, always, Guantanamo. I'm talking about the book of Exodus. Yeah, Exodus 21. I, I read it like three days ago. Okay. Okay. And all it is, is this laying out, here are these certain laws. If this person um, beats their slave, and it doesn't say it's a good thing, it says if this crime happens, here's the punishment to the owner who did it. If the guy dies instantly, then it was first degree murder. If he doesn't, then it wasn't first degree murder. And so he shouldn't be punished for first degree murder. So it was all about protecting the slaves from evil slave oh. owners. And if you read, if you read. This is a, such a dance. Uh, no, it's look, not. Uh, it's, it, it's historically accurate. If, the if way we, we use slavery is not the way you say slavery. Indentured servants indentured don't servitude. get beaten to the point where they're unconscious on the ground for no, 48 they hours. That's why the Bible says. But the Bible did happens, not punish. Punish. punish the master. I, I think the problem is is that the Bible didn't say punish him if he does it. It said yeah. ah, if he gets up within two days, you're okay. I mean, the Bible has directions, God's law, mm-hmm. ordering rape victims to marry their rapist as long as the father gets, mm-hmm. I think, 50 shekels. There were all of these sort of very barbaric stories embedded in the Bible that don't get a lot of face time at Sunday go to meeting for obvious reasons. But if we look at them and we look at the Bible as a whole, what we see is is a reflection of a superstitious, ignorant, and primitive time in human history. Mm -hmm. And a book that came out of those times that reflects the violence, the barbarism, and the ignorance about our world, the ignorance about the universe. And it's been around a long time. Yes, there's a lot of different copies of it, but a well-propagated myth is still a myth. Even if it was true, I, as a moral creature, someone who has an evolved sense of morality— I couldn't hold to a deity that allowed someone to own another human being. I couldn't hold to a deity that allowed or commanded a woman to marry her rapist. I couldn't uh, hold to a deity that would accept a human sacrifice or ask a father to kill his son. All of those things for me, Mm -hmm. even if that stuff is true, and I don't hold that it's remotely Mm -hmm. so, I, as a moral creature, must reject it. And uh, it's it's interesting to me Mm -hmm. to watch such good people defend or excuse or try to contextualize what is genuinely immoral behavior on the behalf of uh, Yahweh. What is just as fascinating to see things framed in a way that benefits a side and puts something without any kind of 
historical context or really just wrestling. I, I didn't just, frame it in a so at our church, dishonest way. At our, at our church, uh, we preach through books of the Bible at a time when we say this, so we can't skip the hard stuff because we're more than willing to go, wait a minute, why did this happen? And like, if I wanted to go into every single bit by bit, point by point, right? We're going to be here for a while. <laughs> yes, yeah, true. Right, right. Like, so yeah. it's, it's the, the sh- I'm not a fan of the shotgun approach, right? Of like, that we call it a gish gallop. Here's, the, uh, here's yeah. 80 different evils in the Bible. And I, I, well, I have you studied with slavery and looked into if you want. Them. I yeah. mean, I'm just trying to sort of pin down moral creatures who are embracing such a, a heinous thing. Right. Um, well, I think enough has been said on the slavery issue. I don't know if your listeners are familiar with the Christian understanding of it, but we've kind of known what indentured servitude was for a while. It's so people who had no money, instead of dying of starvation, could freely enter into uh, a contract. And by seven years, if they hadn't paid it off, they had to be let go. And then there were all these kind of different things, like while they are with you, they have to be treated as an equal. Well, right. So the equality of slavery goes back to the Old Testament, radical for its time. Nobody else did that. Slaves were property unless Judaism happened to be the place that you entered into indentured servitude. It gave more favor and made you as equal. It was the way to get an education. It was a way to get out of poverty. It was all these things. You don't see this as a way to rationalize the owning of another human being as property. Well, we uh, because we're not talking we have about people that are beating, slaves of credit card we're, we're, debt. We're right? not talking they about don't pay. They can be thrown in jail by the government. We're not talking about beating right? so, indentured yeah. servants. We're not yeah. talking about devaluing female indentured servants to be half of what the male indentured servants are worth. We're not talking about the auctioning off, mm-hmm. selling and buying of human beings as indentured servants. I mean, we're talking about human beings who are considered property by another slavery. And physical force against those slaves. And, and it's, uh, I think it's something you and I might agree on, that people, I think, who have questions or would like to genuinely explore this should do so without fear of judgment from on right. high. Correct. That a worthy God would never say, you're in sin because you doubt or you're yeah. weak. And I always encourage people to go back from square one and, and read the Bible. Start right. at Genesis mm-hmm. 1-1 and pour Absolutely. through that sucker and then do it again. Mm-hmm. and I'll make this guarantee to you, and I'm absolutely sincere, whether you believe mm-hmm. me or not, Pastor Moore, that if God showed up tomorrow, I would want to know that. Like, mm-hmm. if God shows up, if God is real, if God exists in whoever yeah. she is, I would want to know that. Right. And I would like to think I would be prepared to change my position mm-hmm. based on that knowledge. Right. And I'll make that guarantee to you. If, yeah. if there is a really good reason. Now, mm-hmm. Allegiance to following that deity that speaks to are you are you good right do you deserve allegiance and worship but to believe in a deity just give me I remember there was you mentioned Ken Ham there was a debate with uh, Bill Nye and Ken Ham at the uh, Creation hard Museum. to watch it was impossible to watch yeah. and at the very end they asked both people they said what would it take to get you to change your mind mm-hmm. Ken Ham was just bah, 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 bah. he just couldn't answer the question. Yeah. Because he'll never, he, he never will allow that his mind might be changed. And they asked Bill Nye, what would you ever change your mind? And he said, one piece of evidence. Mm-hmm. And I'll make that guarantee. A good piece of evidence will help me to change my mind. Yeah. But we're going to have to do better than a book whose authorship can't be determined that makes some pretty wild claims. I, uh, I asked myself that question. And I still ask myself. I said, is there, I was talking to a friend just the other day. I said, um, is there anything that could happen that would change your mind, right? Like, is there something that could be shown? And I, I thought long and hard about it. And I'm like, I feel like the evidence is so substantial that we almost have this embarrassment. And that's why I think it's really interesting when we frame it, well, we don't know the authors, so what? That's a basic so if question. It's a, if it's about, a historical, yeah, we have a, a pretty good I sense. I don't think that's a, an unusual or we gotcha question. We don't have question. certainty that this person wrote. I don't have 100% absolute certainty. That any of the 66 but persons. you just said we don't have certainty that we're even here. But granted my presuppositions, I know that I'm here. I know that logic is not just some invention of the mind. 
I know that like naturalism is true. And I took up a can of Mountain Dew and a can of Dr. Pepper and I open them both up. They're just going to fizz because that's what chemicals do when they interact with their environment. If there's no God, I'm just fizzing Christianity. I have no choice. You are You're automatically declaring, atheism. though, that a God you must have, no have put that wheel in motion. Now, just because we don't yeah. know the origins of the universe doesn't mean that if there's a blank and that blank no. makes us uncomfortable that we rush to fill it. And oh, I no, think, no. The God of the gaps, you know who came up with the God of the gaps, who, who created that phrase? It was a Christian criticizing other Christians yeah. because it says the deeper we go, the more we see him. Well, understand This is why that, I love... Francis Bacon, who's like a little philosophy leads to atheism, a lot of philosophy returns a man to religion. You know, I think, though, that questions shouldn't be swept off the table or marginalized or kind of poo-pooed mm -hmm. when you say, this is a, a true book. Right. And someone says, I need to know where it came from. Right. I think that's a valid question. I mean, don't, right. so, I do. And I don't, I don't think, uh, I think maybe some lay people might sweep that under the rug. But I think a, a lot of people. I think sweep academically, it under the people are more than willing to wrestle. Like, Why would they have to I, wrestle I, with? It, it, think about it. I mean, eternity is in the balance. Do you believe in hell? Yeah. Uh -huh. What uh, fiery hell? Uh, 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 annihilation? What, what's your hell look like? I don't know. I'm I'm uh, kind of in between on okay. where I'm thinking about. All right. So let's say hell. However, it is. Let's say it's a place where they just play nothing but country. I, I, when I they, say, let me clarify. I'm not sure if it's eternal or not. I, I lean that way, but fire, um, burning, that figurative, figurative language. Okay. All right. Yeah, so Fine. the so absence of God is what hell is. Eternity is in the balance. Right. Why do you think God would not make His message? digestible and understandable to the lowest common denominator, the one who has the, le the least capacity for understanding. Mm -hmm. The idea that you would have to have scholarship or that you would have yeah. to go through and jump through a bunch of hoops. I mean, right. you know, my child is in a burning building. Right. Do I rush in and scoop up the child? Mm -hmm. Or do I throw the child a lifeline directly? Or do I write a letter with instructions on how to get out and then give it to a bunch of different people whose names can't ever be verified, right? right. I mean, I don't think these are gotcha questions or no, illegitimate they're not, questions. They're, they're not, not proud I, or arrogant questions. They're how do we know what we know? How do you know right. where it came from? And I think he has made himself so known. There's a reason that a lot of people have this strong faith, but they don't need scholarship. I think the scholarship are for people who might be skeptical possibly i don't want to say hyper skeptical but uh skeptical to a fault or even if there's a rational reason to believe it and that this worldview makes sense and is consistent you go yeah but it's not what i need it's not what i want i want god to do this and i'm like i feel like he's made himself unbelievably known more books poems songs paintings have been done about the person jesus than anybody else Right, the Bible is still the number one selling book and the most shoplifted. That, that, that's so, an argument from so, popularity, no, though. It's so not I'm an saying, argument from validity. So he's he's this little carpenter has evaded the entire world with a singular message, though. Where I might disagree with other apologists on infant baptism or things like that, the core is unbelievably strong. Like we agree on like these essentials. That's what makes somebody a Christian, and the number of them is incredible. So as Roman says, like, you know, I know you know this, you know, you see the world around you, look out, God's invisible nature has made himself known. And I go, yeah, laws of nature. We all see that. Look that's, at the trees kind of thing. You know, look at the tree, you know, yeah, if, absolutely. I mean, that's, and that's, and I know for you, because that hyper skepticism, but great intellectual minds who have created the science that we now use to try to say, see, we don't need God anymore was because athe what, there, there was no need for atheists to even begin to look into science because there was no reason that tomorrow was even promised. Well, there was even, no I mean, underlying you think natural... about the idea of discovery of existence, life, the earth, the cosmos, didn't disappear when people rejected faith. I mean, humans' desire for discovery... But it exploded among... Christians and theologians and there are some philosophers. Christian scientists and Christian philosophers, Christian mm -hmm. authors. There are right. Christians in all shapes and stripes in society. Mm -hmm. But the idea that it all becomes sort of a mute, a, a moot exercise, mm -hmm. it's all void, it's all pointless. Uh, and that scientists who, I mean, there's a, a pretty large amount of secularist, non-religious mm -hmm. people in science. Mm -hmm. The idea that they aren't 
passionately interested in discovery and learning and and finding out what is true, testing, retesting. I mean, those those people are very interested in trying to learn more tomorrow, to know more tomorrow than we know today. Of course. And so I think, you know, to be fair to them. But no, it, it's uh, the beginning of science. It could have happened in any time in culture. What right? could have happened? Like, like people all of a sudden began to really delve in and do science the way we're doing it now because it's still fairly young, right? It's not a, an, an old practice. Um, it comes about through many Christian uh, thinkers who were looking into it because they believed there was uniformity to nature and they wanted to get to know God better. And even Einstein, who was not a Christian, and uh, I know some people would say he was an atheist, hated the idea of being called an atheist. He believed there was some kind of something or other. He didn't think it was personal, but he was... Yeah, he said, I do not believe in a personal God. Yeah, he doesn't think it's personal, but he believes, he's like, man, if you understand these laws, if you understand all this, there's got to be something. And he viewed the idea of even being put in the same group as an atheist as ridiculous because he's like look look at all of this that governs there has to be a hand behind it he just doesn't reach out and grab my hand i don't know i I would make the argument that he's done that through jesus that that he has made himself so well known we just tend to be kind of stubborn and so you say what would it take for you god would already know the answer to that question Mm -hmm. god already if let's say he has me down to the last dna molecule right he already knows what it would take to convince me, mm-hmm. and I'm waiting. Yeah, and he, just any second. Okay, and, I, and I'm here. Right? Uh, see, I didn't know what it would take to convince me. You know what? So I, uh, as an atheist, I uh, became very involved in selling drugs because it seemed like a good way to make money, and I didn't care about. Now you're not making morality. a connection between no. aberrant behavior and atheism. No, right? I'm okay, not. Good. I'm just I just want to double check. <laughs> I, I when <laughs> I used to I used to walk the shadows of the city at night yeah. when I was an atheist and we I ate just, human flesh. I just believe you know, Dostoevsky. Kind of without God, all things are permissible. I believe you remove an absolute moral code. I'm free to make up my own. And I wasn't. I didn't. You know, I wasn't necessarily an evil person. I was nice to all my friends, but I was kind of a jerk. Right. But the idea, though, that morals, the idea that a, a, a godless society is what you just said. To me, makes no sense. Yeah. It, it would devolve immediately in upon itself. And I don't mean this as an ad hominem or personal mm-hmm. attack, but it sounds extremely arrogant for you mm-hmm. to say the only reason that you haven't chewed yourself up to, you know, mm-hmm. into, into yeah. mincemeat is because my God had set sort of the divine standard for goodness in place, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's, that's a, not what I'm saying. If, like, if you remove God, we're all going to go All into things chaos. are permissible. But you, you enter into kind of sometimes what we see right now, this postmodern worldview, because I feel it to be true, therefore it's true, right? That's if not that that, applied I, to morality. People are great at creating their own morality. It's we, true. We are great at creating our own standard that usually makes us look like a good person. We see it within human conditions, religious or not. But right. this is a human tendency. It's not right. religious or non-religious. Yeah. It's not speaking to a God or lack of God. And so the idea that, you know, because we are not religious, we don't have some kind of a bar. We don't have a guideline. There are all things are permissible without God. Dostoevsky is a pretty heavy thinker to wrestle with. Well, you can quote a human being to prove the point, but I'm saying that all around you, especially with the rise of atheism here in the United States, we're seeing, the rise of the non-religious, you know, the 30 and under is leaving the churches in droves. They don't really, they don't, they're not interested. They don't really need it. Are you saying that there is a rise of, of the sort of aberrant type of behavior because all things are permissible? Do you feel like that we're not seeing people acting in ethical, moral ways who want better things, who want to help other people? Because I see a lot of it out there in the world. And many of these people, a great many people of these have nothing to do with Christianity. So for you to say, Without essentially, what you're saying is, without my God, all yeah. things are permissible. Yeah, you you have no ultimate justification, is what Dostoevsky is saying. That there is no ultimate justification, and yes, right is. now our society would, um, uh, if if there was no God, it would be perfectly permissible. So, what benefits you benefits me, benefits society, benefits right. the human condition, the tribe. The idea that it's 
that it would just be Thunderdome yeah. out there. To no, me, it seems like a kind of a vacuous way of approaching. There's benefit, um, but there's also – so I was thinking I, – I was listening to somebody talk the other day, and I think it was your friend Matt. And maybe we can wrap up with this because I know yeah, we're going. I know. You've been very generous right. no, with your no, time. I, I love it. Um, so Matt, how do you say his last name? Dillahaney? Dillahunty. Uh, Dillahunty, yeah. Although was, I'd like to call him Dillahaney, Dillahaney for the rest right? of his Just life. call him yeah. that from now on. <laughs> okay. uh, he was talking about Sam Harris, and they were making a joke. I think it was an interview he did with Jordan Peterson. And he was talking about pushing Sam Harris off the stage and how that would be morally wrong because he doesn't want to get pushed off the stage. And I said, yes, because self-preservation is strong. You don't want to get hurt, therefore you don't hurt people. I says, but what if there was a beam that was about to fall down from the ceiling and you didn't have time to warn him? And if you did warn him, he would just look up and see his death coming. Because the moral system that he has or that naturalism would say self-preservation is one of the highest values, you would just go, oh, this stinks, Scripture says no greater love has a man than this to lay down his life for another. So actually, this moral idea goes beyond self-pervasion and it says lay down your life for somebody else. A Christian, we would hope, would push him out of the way. You're saying that, that allow- Matt would not see a sacrificial act as the moral act because it didn't benefit him directly? I'm saying he's standing on my foundation when he does so. But if you're going because to make the that naturalistic claim, one, we're back to the claim and you're going to have to back it up. Right, yeah. Um, and I, you know, at the end of the day, after almost two hours of talking, I want everyone to know that, notice that we haven't thrown bottles at each other, at least, you know, not glass ones. I have my brass knuckles on. <laughs> <laughs> one last question here before we wrap it up. Yeah. Um, you're a graphic novel guy. Yes, so, you know, if we're going to talk That's about what adults call them, but it's still comic comics. Books. Yeah, you're I wanted to end on something kind of light. Um, but I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought it's not really a light question because people get rabid. So I'm going to just say two words and you just take it where you want to go. Marvel or DC? What's DC? <laughs> really? Do you see the films? No. Are you a purist? DC who? Really? Yes, I'm a purist. Um, uh, 100% sold out to Marvel. Um, <laughs> I, I think DC, they don't know what to do with their characters. You have Superman in the comic books who can blow out a star. He's so powerful, there's nobody that can go against him. So <laughs> it, it's so boring. In almost every DC superhero movie, at the end, there's going to be some ray shooting up in the sky and all these... You don't know where these goons came from. They're kind of alien things, and there's a million of them all of a sudden, and they have to fight these things because their villains don't really need a backstory or a name. It's just just wipe it out. They they don't do good with characters. You mentioned DC, yeah. and my dog started barking. I don't know yes. if you can hear him in the background. Yeah. So it just, trigger word. Sorry about trigger that, word. Linus. Yeah. Sorry, yes. pal. Now Aquaman, I enjoyed really, but that's as far as I can go. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, we'll uh, we'll stay sacred. The sacred canon of Marvel. Then right. We'll, yes. we'll stay there. My friend, um, I really am glad to know you. I'm, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to have a conversation. Uh, and, uh, you know, even though you and I, we have spirited discussion about the things that matter to us. Right. At the end of the day, I, I hope we see each other as people, human yeah. beings, right? And, and uh, whether we ever agree or not, I still would like to be your friend. Yeah, and I absolutely. think we can get along. And hopefully this role models for other people. What I, what I get frustrated with, and I know this frustrates you, if there's a Christian atheist debate on YouTube and the Christian uploads it, all the comments are, you really showed him that atheists don't know what they're doing. If the atheist uploads it, those Christians are really stupid. Atheist slaughters Christian yes, slaughters. in science debate. Yeah, so I'm going to upload this on my <laughs> podcast. Right? Can, I, can I plug my podcast? Uh, please do. Uh, Go ahead. Dog Go ahead. Backwards is my podcast where we look at life and theology from a different angle. Um, can I title this Caleb Slaughters? <laughs> Caleb slaughters, slaughters Atheist. Yes. Pastor Slaughters Atheist in debate about morality. Who loves God. DC movies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah I've, I've no, seen it done. Right? And, and yeah. it's, it's, it's a shame. It's a shame. It in some ways dehumanizes us. I get the attraction. Right. I get the frustration sometimes of arguing what we care passionately about, but I, sh- I am more and more, and people will see this in the focus of my work lately is I sh- the internet is amazing. It has so connected us, but it is also in so many ways sort of disconnected and dehumanized. Right. We're fighting the avatars. We're, 
looking for the retweet. We're not really seeing each other as flesh and blood people. And uh, so everybody, I mean, Pastor Caleb's good people, and I'm glad to know we him. We step out of that echo chamber for just a second. And yeah. It's, don't and be scared. I'll, one of these days, I'll go to, we'll catch a Marvel movie together or something like that. Okay. Um, your website is what? CalebMoore.tv. C-L-A-E-B. Mm-hmm. Caleb yeah. Moore. Yes. Dot TV. Correct. My friend, and it's, it's been only a dot TV, not because there's, you know, that just sounds like such a preacher evangelist. Like, I don't care. More dot TV. <laughs> Look, everything else cost a lot of money. This one was like eight bucks. So that's where we are. All right. Caleb Moore. Pastor Moore, it's been Seth. a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. Thank you. Appreciate it, buddy. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.